So I started seeing graphics pop up on social media this past week that said about Gaza, it's not war, it's murder. So I started asking people what exactly they think war is then if it's distinct from murder. Well, war, some of them told me, takes place between armies. So I asked for anyone to name a war during the past century, that is after World War I, where all or even most or even a majority of the dying was done by members of armies. Now, there may have been such a war. There are enough scholars here in the room today that somebody probably knows one or two. If so, it's not the norm. And these people that I was chatting with on social media couldn't think of any such war, and that yet they just insisted that that's just what war is. So is war then over and nobody told us? <laughs> For whatever reasons, I then began very soon to see a graphic sent around on social media that said about Gaza, it is not war, it's genocide. And the typical explanation I got when I questioned this one was that the wagers of war and the wagers of genocide have different attitudes. Are we sure about that? I've spoken to advocates for recent U.S. wars who wanted all or part of a population destroyed. I have spoke, there are plenty of supporters of the latest attacks on Gaza who see them as counter-terrorism. In wars between advanced militaries and poor peoples, most of the death and injury is on one side, and most of it, by everybody's definition, is civilian. This is as true in Afghanistan, where war rolls on largely unchallenged, as in Gaza, about which we are newly outraged. Well, what's wrong with outrage? Who cares what people call it? Why not criticize the war advocates rather than nitpicking the war opponent's choice of words? When people are outraged, they will reach for whatever word their culture tells them is most powerful, be it murder or genocide or whatever. Why not encourage that and worry a little more about the lunatics who are calling it defense or policing or terrorist removal? Eight-year-old terrorists. Yes. Of course, I agree, and I have been going after CNN newsreaders for claiming Palestinians want to die, and NBC for yanking its best reporter, and ABC for claiming that scenes of destruction in Gaza that just don't exist in Israel were in fact in Israel, and the U.S. government for providing the weapons and the criminal immunity. I've been promoting rallies and events aimed at swaying public opinion against what Israel may be doing and against the sadistic, bloodthirsty culture of those standing on the hills cheering for the death and destruction below, quite regardless of whatever they call it. But as you are probably aware, only the very most open-minded advocates of war attend Veterans for Peace conventions. <laughs> so I am speaking here backstage, as it were, at the peace movement, among those of us who want to stop the killing. Are there better and worse ways to talk about it? Is there anything revealed by the ways in which we tend to talk about it when we are not hyper-focused on our language? I think so. I think it is telling that the worst word anyone can think of isn't war. I think it's even more telling that we condemn things by contrasting them with war, framing war as relatively acceptable. I think this fact ought to be unsettling because a very good case can be made that war is in fact the worst thing we do, and that the distinctions between war and such evils as murder and genocide can require squinting very hard to discern them. We've all heard that guns don't kill people, people kill people. There is a parallel belief that wars don't kill people, people who misuse wars, who fight bad wars, who fight wars improperly kill people. This is a big contrast with many other evil institutions. We don't oppose child abuse selectively, holding out the possibility of just and good incidents of child abuse while opposing the bad or dumb or non-strategic or excessive cases of child abuse. We don't have human rights groups writing reports on atrocities and possible law violations committed in the course of abusing children. We don't have Geneva Conventions for proper conduct while abusing children. We don't distinguish UN-sanctioned child abuse. The same goes for numerous behaviors, generally understood as always evil. Slavery, rape, blood feuds, 
dueling, dogfighting, sexual harassment, bullying, human experimentation, producing piles of I'm ready for Hillary posters. <laughs> we, we don't imagine there are good, just, defensible cases of these behaviors. <clears throat> and this is the core problem. Not support for bombing Gaza or Afghanistan or Pakistan or Iraq or anywhere else that's actually getting bombed, but support for an imaginary war in the near future between two enemies who are armies with different colored jerseys and sponsors competing on an isolated battlefield apart from any villages or towns and suffering bravely and heroically for their non-murderous, non-genocidal cause while complying with the whistles blown by the referees in the human rights organizations whenever any of the proper killing drifts into lawless imprisonment or torture or use of inappropriate weaponry. Support for specific possible wars in the United States right now is generally under 10%. More people believe in ghosts, angels, and the integrity of our electoral system than want a new U.S. war in Ukraine, Syria, Iran, or Iraq. The Washington Post found a little over 10% want a war in Ukraine for the United States military, but that the people who held that view were the people who placed Ukraine furthest on a world map from where its actual location is, including people who placed Ukraine in the United States. <laughs> These are the idiots who favor specific actual wars. Even Congress, speaking of idiots, on Friday <laughs> told Obama no new war on Iraq. Stood up for itself as an institution rather than a political party I, we haven't seen since 1973. Deserves some applause for once, the United States Congress. Um, the problem, the problem is the people ranging across the population from morons right up to geniuses who favor imaginary wars. Millions of people will tell you we need to be prepared for more wars in case there's another Adolf Hitler. Failing to understand that the wars and militarism and weapon sales and weapons gifts, the whole U.S. role as arsenal of democracies and dictatorships around the world, increases rather than decreasing the danger that other wealthy countries spend less than 10% what the U.S. does on their militaries, and that 10% of what the U.S. spends on its military could end global starvation, provide the globe with clean water, and fund sustainable energy and agriculture policies that would go further toward preventing mass violence than any stockpiles of weaponry. Okay. Millions. Millions will tell you that the world needs a global policeman. Even while polls of the world say the United States is the greatest threat to peace on earth. In fact, if you start asking people who have opposed every war in our lifetimes, or in the past decade, to work on opposing the entire institution of war, you will be quite surprised by many of the people who say no. I'm a big fan of a book called Addicted to War. How many people have you seen this? It's like a comic book, Addicted to War. I think it will probably be a powerful tool for the abolition of war right up until war is abolished. But its author told me this week that he cannot work to oppose all wars because he favors some of them. Specifically, he said he doesn't want to ask Palestinians to not defend themselves. Now, there is a truly vicious cycle. If we can't shut down the institution of war because Palestinians need to use it, then it's harder to go after U.S. military spending, which is, of course, what funds much of the weaponry being used on the Palestinians. I think we should get a little clarity about what a war abolition movement does and does not do. It does not tell people what they must do when attacked. And if I tell people in Palestine to do something and they don't do it, I don't bomb them. I don't even think less of them. Uh, this, is, this is not what a, a peace movement does. It is not focused on advising at all, much less instructing the victims of war, but on preventing their victimization. It does not advise the individual victim of a mugging to turn the other cheek. But it also does not accept the disproven notion that violence is a defensive strategy for a population. 
Nonviolence has proven far more effective and its victories longer lasting. If people in Gaza have done anything at all to assist in their own destruction, it is not the supposed offenses of staying in their homes or visiting hospitals or playing on beaches. It is the ridiculously counterproductive firing of rockets that only encourages and provides political cover for war, genocide, murder, whatever you want to call it. I'm a huge fan of a writer named Chris Hedges. Yeah. And I find him one of the most useful and inspiring writers we have. But he thought attacking Libya was a good idea until it quite predictably and obviously turned out to be a disaster. He still thinks Bosnia was a just war. So I could go through dozens of names of people who contribute mightily to an anti-war movement who oppose abolishing war. The point is not that anyone who believes in one good war out of a hundred is to blame for the trillion dollar US military budget and all the destruction it brings. The point is that they are wrong about that one war out of a hundred and that even if they were right, the side effects of maintaining a culture accepting of war preparations would outweigh the benefits of getting that one war right. The lives lost by not spending a trillion dollars a year in the United States and another trillion in the rest of the world put together on useful projects like environmental protection, sustainable agriculture, medicine, hygiene, dwarfs the number of lives that would be saved by halting our routine level of war making. If you talk about abolishing war entirely, and many of us have begun focusing on this through a new project called World Beyond War, you'll also find people who want to abolish war, but believe it can't be done. War is natural, they say, inevitable, in our genes, decreed by our economy, the unavoidable result of racism or consumerism or capitalism or exceptionalism or carnivorism or nationalism. And of course, many cultural patterns interact with and facilitate war. But the idea that it's in our genes is absurd, given how many cultures of our species have done and do without it. I don't know what, if anything, people usually mean when they call something natural, but presumably it is not the provocation of suicide, which is such a common result of participation in war. While the first case of PTSD due to war deprivation has yet to be discovered, <laughs> most of our species' existence as hunter-gatherers did not know war. And, the on, and only in the last century, a split second, in evolutionary terms, has known war that it all resembles war today. War didn't used to kill like this. Soldiers weren't conditioned to kill. Most of the guns picked up on the field in Gettysburg were loaded multiple times, not fired. The big killers were diseases, even in that U.S. Civil War that the U.S. media calls the most deadly U.S. war because Filipinos and Koreans and Vietnamese and Iraqis don't count. Now the big killer is a disease in our thinking, a combination of what Dr. King calls self-guided missiles and misguided men and women. Uh, another hurdle for abolishing war is that the idea rose to popularity in the West in the 1920s and 30s and then sank into a category of thought that is vaguely treasonous. War abolition was tried and failed, the thinking goes, like communism or labor unions, and now we know better. While abolishing war is popular in much of the world, that fact is easily ignored by the 1% who misrepresent the 10% or 15% who live in the places that constitute the so-called international community. Nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come, or weaker than an idea whose time has come and gone, or so we think. But the Renaissance was, as its name suggests, an idea whose time had come again, new and improved and victorious. The 1920s and the 1930s are a resource for us. We have stockpiles of wisdom to draw upon. We have examples of where things were headed and how they went off track. Andrew Carnegie took war profits and set up an endowment for peace with a mandate to eliminate war and then hold a board meeting determine the second most evil thing in the world and begin eliminating that. Sounds eccentric, sounds unique, but I think that is a basic understanding of ethics that ought to be understood and acted upon by all of us. 
When someone asks me why I'm a peace activist, I ask them why in the hell anyone isn't. <laughs> so reminding the Carnegie Endowment for Peace and so many other groups what they are legally obligated to do, and that includes the Nobel Committee, by the way, which if they give another prize to another bloodthirsty presidential candidate, they're going to have to be shut down for good. Uh, this is part of the process of reviving and building a better war abolition movement. The case against war that's laid out at worldbeyondwar.org includes these topics. War is immoral. War endangers us. War threatens our environment. War erodes our liberties. War impoverishes us. And we need $2 trillion a year for other things. I find the case to be overwhelming and su suspect that many of you would agree. In fact, Veterans for Peace and numerous chapters and members of Veterans for Peace have been among the first to sign on and participate. And we've begun finding that thousands of people and organizations from around the world agree and, and have added their names on the website and support the ending of all war. People from 68 countries and rising, not quite the 175 the Pentagon claims to be in, but we're getting there. And many of these people and organizations are not peace groups. They are environmental groups and civic groups of all sorts and varieties. We're trying to build a mainstream, widespread movement. Our hope is, of course, to enlarge the peace movement by making abolition of war as mainstream as abolition of cancer. When you start, anybody got a light blue scarf? Stand up, John. When you start seeing light blue everything as much as you see pink everything, <laughs> and abolishing war is as prevalent and public as abolishing cancer, we'll be getting somewhere. Uh, Yes, someone mentioned or mumbled to the uh, Afghan peace volunteers who came up with the idea of wearing the sky blue uh, scarves to represent the one sky that we all live under and numerous organizations uh, have been promoting wearing sky blue and uh, World Beyond War is one of them. Um, But we think that enlarging the peace movement is not the only alteration that could benefit. We think a focus on each anti-war project as part of a broader campaign to end the whole institution of war will significantly change how specific wars and weapons and tactics are opposed. How many of you have heard appeals to oppose Pentagon waste? I'm in favor of Pentagon waste and opposed to Pentagon efficiency. <laughs> how, how can we not be when what the Pentagon does is evil? ISIS, the best funded terrorist organization in the world. The Pentagon is the best funded terrorist organization in the world. How, how many of you have heard of opposition to unnecessary wars that leave the military ill-prepared. <laughs> I'm in favor of leaving the military ill-prepared, but not of distinguishing unnecessary from supposedly necessary wars. Which are the necessary ones? When sending missiles into Syria is stopped, in large part by public pressure, war as a last resort is replaced by all sorts of other options that were always available. Yeah. That would be the case any time any war is stopped. War is never a last resort, any more than rape or child abuse is a last resort. How many of you have seen opposition to U.S. wars that focuses almost exclusively on the financial cost and the suffering endured by Americans? Yeah. Did you know that polls find Americans believing that Iraq benefited and the United States suffered from the war that destroyed Iraq? <laughs> and that they're grateful. That is majority belief in this country, that they are grateful. What if the financial costs and the costs to the aggressor nation were in addition to the moral objections to mass slaughter rather than instead of? How many of you have seen anti-war organizations trumpet their love for troops and veterans and war holidays, or groups like AARP that advocate for benefits for the elderly by focusing almost entirely on elderly veterans as though veterans are the most deserving? 
Is that good activism? I want to celebrate those who resist and oppose war, not those who engage in it. I love that it is for peace because it's for peace. It's for peace in a certain powerful way, but it's the being for peace part that I value. And being for peace in the straightforward meaning of being against war. Most organizations are afraid of being for peace. It's always peace and justice, or peace and something else, or it's peace in our hearts and peace in our homes, and the world will take care of itself. As veterans for peace know, the world doesn't take care of itself. The world is driving itself off a cliff. As Woody Allen said, I don't want to live on in the hearts of my countrymen. I want to live on in my apartment. <laughs> well, I don't want to find peace in my heart or my garden. I want to find peace in the elimination of war. Yeah. At worldbeyondwar.org is a list of projects we think help advance that. If framed as part of that larger cause, uh, steps in the right direction. Creating an easily recognizable and joinable mainstream international movement to end all war. <clears throat> Education about war, peace, and nonviolent action, including all that is to be gained by ending war. Improving access to accurate information about wars, exposing lies. Improving, ac uh, increasing, improving access to information about successful steps away from war in other parts of the world. Increased understanding of partial steps as movement in the direction of eliminating rather than reforming war. Partial disarmament, full disarmament conversion or transition to peaceful industries, closing, converting, or donating foreign military bases, democratizing militaries while they exist and making them truly volunteer, banning foreign weapon sales and gifts, 79% of weapon sales into the Middle East from this country. Stop that. Democratizing, uh, outlawing, profiteering from war, banning the use of mercenaries and private contractors, abolishing the CIA and other secret agencies, promoting diplomacy and international law and consistent enforcement of laws against war, including prosecutions of violators, reforming or replacing the UN and the ICC, expansion of peace teams and human shields, promotion of non-military foreign aid and crisis prevention, placing restrictions on military recruitment and providing potential soldiers with alternatives, thanking resistors for their service, encouraging cultural exchange, discouraging racism and nationalism, developing less destructive and exploitative lifestyles, and expanding the use of public demonstrations and nonviolent civil resistance to enact these changes. And I would add learning from and working with organizations that have been like Veterans for Peace working toward war abolition for years and years and inspiring others to do the same. And I would invite you all to work with us at World Beyond War toward our common goal.